Judge Benton was having zero tolerance for those that dared to come into his courtroom and try to corrupt the justice system. He had just went through a grueling five-week trial due to the Markham damage case. During the trial, evidence had been presented of corruption, conspiracy, tampering with the witnesses that were due to testify in his courtroom. He immediately signed warrants for the arrest of those he deemed that were responsible for those deeds. In today's video, we will go over the charges laid against those that dared to stand against the justice system. Come along with us as we see how one court case led to several others. Would justice finally be served? All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine! Please fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. The Markham Damage Case The Markham jury turned in its final verdict on Monday, December 9, 1905 at 4 o'clock p.m. As we have seen, the Markham case had really shown everyone that there was something suspicious about what was going on in Bretha County and that something needed to be done to bring back justice to the people who were residents there. The case would go all the way up to the Kentucky State Court of Appeals and be upheld. Even though both sides of the case did file motions for dismissal of the charges or a case retrial, both of these motions were dropped and the criminal trials would begin. We will see confessions and convictions from unexpected people involved in this case. Please remember that all of the trial witnesses for the Britton and Markham cases will also be testifying in the upcoming cases. And because of their testimonies are exactly the same, we will not repeat them. However, we will bring forward all new witnesses and confessions. The First Arrest Just 18 days later, the first report of arrest was made in connection to the conspiracy in Breathitt County, Kentucky. According to the Frankfurt Roundabout, January 28, 1905, quote, Indicted In the Fayette Circuit Court on Wednesday, Following the revelations made in the trial of Bill Britton for the murder of James Cockrell, indictments were found against James Hargis, Alex Hargis, Albert Hargis, Ed Callahan, and James Spicer, charging them all with conspiracy with Britton and Curtis Jett to murder James Cockrell, marshal of the town of Jackson. Other indictments will probably be found against some of these parties in Breathitt County. Based upon the evidence in the case of Mrs. Markham against Hargis, French, and others, altogether it is a sweet kettle of fish. Unquote. We have some new names that were indicted in this round of criminal court action. We will see the confession of James Spicer come up later when it is his turn to testify. But for now, he is just named in the criminal cases. With indictments, it is not long before arrest warrants were issued. According to the Breathitt County News, February 3rd, 1905, quote, Warrants Issued Judge Benton of Winchester issued warrants Tuesday for James Hargis, Ed Callahan, B.F. French on the charge of running off certain witnesses for the plaintiff in the damage suit of Mrs. Markham against the defendants. One charge is made against the two Hargises and their bail is fixed at $2,000 each. There are two charges against B.F. French, and his total bail was fixed at $3,000. Against Ed Callahan, there are three separate charges, and the total bail required of him is $4,000. French was at once arrested and gave bond. Warrants were also issued for the arrest of Mose Feltner and Sam Fields of Leslie County, the witnesses who left without testifying. Feltner's bond was fixed at $500 and Fields at $200. Judge Benton feels deeply that the attempt to tamper with the integrity and dignity of his court, unquote. Let's break down the bail set for each of these men in January 2024 money amounts. For each of the Harguses, their bail was set at $2,000 in 1905, 
which amounts to $69,715 each in 2024 money. The bail set for B.F. French was $3,000 in 1905, which amounts to $104,572.50 in 2024. Ed Callahan had the biggest amount set against him at $4,000 in 1905, which would be $139,430 in 2024's currency. There would be more cases coming before the year was over, but round one was over pretty quickly. Kentucky State Court of Appeals steps in. Just 11 days after the arrest warrants were signed for the men on February 8, 1905, we find a couple of interesting things published in the Adair County News. It seems that there was another arrest of the conspirators that had taken place. The conspirators were now in the court with Judge Watts Parker presiding. The jurisdiction of this trial was called into question by the Kentucky State Court of Appeals. Quote, writ of prohibition. It was granted to the attorneys of Hargis by the appellate court. Frankfort, Kentucky. February 1st, the Kentucky Court of Appeals granted a temporary writ of prohibition against Judge Watts Parker of the Fayette City Court, restraining him from proceeding under the indictment recently found in that court against James Hargis and others, charging complicity in the murder of Town Marshal Cockrell of Jackson and from attempting to take the persons charged into custody pending final action by the court of the last resort here. The court then set the case down for oral arguments before it on Friday, February 10th, next, and it will pass finally on the motion of the persons charged for a permanent writ of prohibition. In the meantime, the defendants were at liberty to visit Lexington or go elsewhere without fear of arrest. Attorneys for the Hargises say that when the appellate court passes upon the motion for a writ of their clients, will appear in whichever court has jurisdiction of the charge against them. No application will be made for troops to bring the Hargises to Lexington until after the court here has acted finally in the matter of jurisdiction. Jackson, Kentucky, February 1st. Judge James Hargis expressed himself as being very much pleased with the granting by the Court of Appeals of a writ of prohibition restraining further proceedings in the James Cockrell case by the Fayette County authorities, unquote. So, what is a writ of prohibition and what is it used for? Simply put, it is a judicial order that is handed down to prevent a lower court to interfere with the proceedings of a higher court in a case. This is also given to lower courts who do not have the right to try cases not in their jurisdiction. The Meeting of Sinister Minds Nothing happened in a vacuum when it came to Breathitt County. There was no such thing as an unsanctioned murder or crime. Either you were on the hardest side of the feuds or you were not. It was just that simple and those that dared to cross or come against them met with feudal justice. When the plan of the murder started taking shape, there were meetings and conferences held to discuss the matter. Mose Feltner will walk us through the planned meetings that were held to discuss the murders of J.B. Markham and James Cockrell. According to the Daily Public Ledger, they relayed the testimony of Mose Feltner that appeared in the Courier-Journal. Quote, Feltner said that on the night in question, he and John Abner and John Smith left the boarding house of Lewis Hayes to go to the Hargis store for the conference. They arrived at the store somewhat early as the lights were still burning and they proceeded to the post office where they remained for a few minutes, then went on to the store and upstairs to the office. When asked why he and the others had not entered the store while the lights were burning, Feltner said that it had been agreed before that neither he nor any of the others should enter the store while the clerks were on duty, but to wait till the lights had been extinguished, which would be the signal that all of the clerks had gone home. He said that this had been agreed on at the conference held the night before, when only the killing of Markham was discussed. Tom White was present at that conference, unquote. So, 
Why didn't they want anyone to know who was going in and out of the Hargis Brothers store office? Was this to protect the Hargis Brothers from their crimes? Were the secret meetings after the clerks left to keep them from having to testify against the Hargis Brothers? Now, having worked in several stores over the years, I can tell you that when the main lights go off, that does not mean that everyone has gone home yet. There is a lot to do before the doors are locked up for the night. Cash registers have to be counted. Coolers and some shelves need to be stocked. Final sweeping of the floor needs to be finished are just some of the last minute things that need to be completed for the morning shift. Did the Hargis Brothers store have the same end of night touch ups or did they simply go home after their last customer left for the night? And if they were still in the store, how did they not notice the men standing at the post office section? The placement of weapons. One of the essential elements to any crime planning would be what weapons would and should be used. Mose would testify where he saw the weapons, where they were moved to, and why they were moved. According to the same article, quote, Witness said that there were a number of guns, rifles, and pistols in Hargis's office and that he and Abner and Smith had taken several of the guns to their rooms at the Hayes boarding house, where they would be when needed, unquote. So, why did they move the guns to the Hayes boarding house? Was this to make sure that if there were any shootings or arrests that were made, that the Hargis brothers would remain in the clear? The Conspirators' Meeting Feltner would testify that there was some disagreement about who should be shot first, Cockrell or Markham. This would be important as it seems that both men were marked for death. According to the same article, quote, Witness said that during this conference, while he, Jim Hargis, Ed Callahan, and Abner and Smith were in the room, Alex Hargis came in and asked what had been done. Callahan told Alex Hargis nothing had been agreed upon at that time. Witness said only that the killing of Markham had been discussed up to that time. Alex Hargis entered the room. Alex Hargis proposed that Jim Cockrell be killed first and that Markham would become scared and leave the country and would not have to be killed. Jim Hargis would not agree to this and insisted that Markham be killed and that Cockrell would be killed later. Witness said that Callahan agreed to this plan and said that Markham should be killed first and that he was the attorney against him in a court of appeals in a case which involved about $40,000 and that the case would come up within a few days from that time and urged Markham's death to be agreed upon by all parties, unquote. Now, this is very interesting. Callahan was involved in a case in which there was $40,000 on the line? In January 2024, USD currency, this amount would be $1,394,300. That was quite a bit of money to have to hand over if the case was lost. And Callahan most likely felt that if Markham was killed, that the case would have to be dropped against him. At this time, we could not find the case in which Callahan is referring to. Perhaps later, the case will become available online. It is interesting that Alex Hargis suggested the death of Cockrell first so that Markham could be run out of the country. Was this an attempt to spare Markham? If the hatred that the Hargis brothers felt against Markham was over an accusation that happened many years ago, why did they feel that it would not go away until Markham was dead? Would it have not been better for Markham to remain alive and retract his accusation against the men? The Reason Behind the Death of James Cockrell One of the more confusing and interesting motives was that behind the death of James Cockrell, the town marshal. Was this death because of the fact that Tom and James Cockrell defended Markham during an argument while depositions were being taken? Or could it have been for another reason entirely? According to the same article, Feltner gives us an alternative reason for the death of Cockrell. Quote, witness said that during this conference, Alex Hargis said that with Jim Cockrell dead, it would be an easy matter to hang Tom Cockrell, who was then in jail for the murder of Ben Hargis. 
but that it would be impossible to hang Tom Cockrell if Jim Cockrell should be present at the trial, unquote. So with this, we have to backtrack a little. Benjamin Hargis and Tom Cockrell had gotten into a shootout at a blind tiger. Cockrell was wounded, but Hargis was killed. Ben Hargis happened to be the brother to Alex and James Hargis. There would certainly be a cause to want to see, quote, legal justice, unquote, for the death of their brother. And the only way that they felt that they could get this justice was to prevent Tom's brother James from testifying in the case. It is also noteworthy to discover that Markham had taken Tom Cockrell's case pro bono, which would also add yet another reason for the Hargis brothers to hate Markham. Who was Jesse Fields? According to the website Find a Grave, Jesse Fields was born on December 1, 1857 on Browns Fork, Perry County, Kentucky. He was the son of Henry H. Fields and Louisa Combs Fields. Jesse was married to Elizabeth Hurt Couch and Sally Ann Couch Fields. He would have four children, Robert Henry, Margaret Fields Merrill, Napoleon, and Mary Fields Pittman. Fields would be accused of the murders of Joseph Eversoll and Judge Combs in Perry County. However, before Jesse Fields could go to court to prove his innocence or guilt in the matter, he was shot and killed. For more information about Jesse Fields and his participation in the French Eversoll feud, please refer to our video, The Complete French and Eversoll Feud. The Death of Jesse Fields Jesse would be killed on April 19, 1900, at the age of 42 years old in Breathitt County. The man accused of killing him was Moses B. Feltner. So, what happened there? The French and Hargis factions were working for the same side, it seems. Both sides were even named as defendants in the Markham Damage case. So, why would a man from the Hargis faction kill a man from the French faction? So let's walk through what the newspapers of the day say that happened that led to the death of Jesse Fields. Several newspapers of the day reported the same article. Some of them that we were able to find include the Daily Public Ledger, April 27, 1900, the Hickman Courier, May 4, 1900, and the Owingsville Outlook, May 2, 1900. Quote, The Commonwealth, Jesse Fields Killed. One of the leaders in the French Eversold feud shot from his horse. Jackson, Kentucky, April 27th. Jesse Fields, one of the most noted of all the mountain feudal fighters in Kentucky, died from the effects of a pistol shot wound. Fields was one of the leaders in the famous French Eversold feud. The shooting of Fields occurred at a blind tiger 16 miles from this place. A difficulty arose between Jesse Fields and Farmer Gilbert. Both quickly drew revolvers and began firing. Fields got behind the fence and Gilbert shielded himself with a convenient mulberry tree and the trouble proceeded uninterruptedly until the weapons of both men were empty. Neither man had been hurt and they subsequently made friends. A little later in the evening Fields bade all present goodbye and got upon his horse to go home. As he started to ride off, it is charged, two shots were fired and French's trusted man fell from his horse, mortally wounded. It is asserted that both Gilbert and Feltner, one of Gilbert's friends, fired simultaneously at Fields, though it is not known which killed him. Gilbert and Feltner have disappeared, unquote. It seems that Fields did not die immediately, and there was a motive behind the murder. According to the Find a Grave web source, quote, Jesse Fields dead. Jesse Fields was shot Tuesday near Jackson by Mose Feltner and died from the effects of the wound Thursday. Fields had loaned Feltner $120 and the difficulty arose over his trying to collect it. He, Fields, was one of the worst men in the mountains and one of the principals in the French Eversold feud. He was tried for murder of Judge Combs, Jesse's uncle of Hazard. A few years ago, at that time of his death, he was under indictment for the murder near Jackson recently, unquote. The Winchester Democrat, Tuesday, May 1st, 1900, unquote. So, was this really a dispute over a loan? There are so many unanswered questions about this, if that was true. 
Why did Mose Feltner go to Jesse Fields to borrow one hundred and twenty dollars? As of the first week of February, twenty twenty four, the one hundred and twenty dollars in nineteen hundred would be worth four thousand three hundred and ninety two dollars and nine cents. What did Feltner use the money for? Did he intend to pay back the money, or was it used as an excuse to kill Fields? Was Fields a marked man because he was accused of killing his own uncle? Was there something that the French faction of the French ever so viewed was afraid that Fields was going to expose during court, and so they had the man from Hargis faction to dispose of the problem? There are just a few of these questions that will never be answered because there is not enough evidence to discover a true motive if the loan was not the reason behind the crime. How Feltner was caught There are some reports that Feltner was not injured during the shooting of Fields. However, we did find a report that he was indeed wounded, and this led to his being found for the crime. According to the Mount Vernon Signal, May 4, 1900, Quote, Deputy Sheriff Thomas Houchel, after searching two days for Moses Feltner, who killed Jesse Fields in Breathitt County, finally landed his man in Leslie County, but found that Feltner was so badly wounded from a shot in the leg, supposed to have been fired by Fields. Unquote. Now, we have Houchel finding Feltner in Leslie County, but even though he found him, the article does not say that he was arrested during that time which was very curious. Was Feltner wounded so badly in the shooting that he was unable to move out of his sick bed? That this led to a reward being offered by the Kentucky State Governor in his later arrest? According to the Mount Vernon Signal, June 29, 1900, quote, Moses Feltner, who killed Jesse Fields the feudist a few months ago, was captured in Knott County by Deputy Sheriff Sherman Cope and lodged in jail at Jackson. Governor Beckham had offered a $300 reward for his capture, unquote. Now, while we could not find documentation about what happened to Feltner during this time, we will discover in an article a little later in this video where Feltner went to trial, was found guilty, and spent a year in prison for this crime. He would be released after a year by the help of attorney J.B. Markham. More Legal Troubles but his legal troubles over this murder would not end there. He would be rearrested on a bench warrant for the same crime. According to the testimony of his mother, Rebecca Bailey, that B.F. French and Ed Callahan would help him out of trouble if he were to do as they asked. Keeping that promise in mind, this is what happened in October of 1904 in the court of Judge Hargis. According to the Daily Public Ledger, October 11, 1904, Quote, Mose Feltner, charged with the murder of Jesse Fields, was arrested on a bench warrant at Jackson, but was released by Judge Hargis after having been arrested at Winchester previously on the same charge and released on bond. He had five pistols on his person when arrested. Unquote. We could not find an actual play-by-play -play concerning the trial of Feltner concerning this case. It was most likely due to the fact that the Markham Damage case and several other criminal trials were also taking place during this exact same time. We can suppose that some of these witnesses that testified to the other cases were also lending their voices to this trial, but we cannot say for certain. All we have found so far is this article concerning the case. However, Feltner's trial was moved to another court, to Irvine, Kentucky. We can only suppose that it is because of the Markham Damage case that had exposed so much corruption in Breathitt County in December of 1904 through 1905 that Judge Hargis could not try any cases that fell under the umbrella of the feud anymore. According to the Breathitt County News, December 22, 1905, quote, Most Feltner on trial at Irvine. The case against Most Feltner, charged with the murder of Jesse Fields, came up for trial at Irvine on last Tuesday. The jury was made up on Wednesday, and Robert Fields, brother of Jesse, was the first witness introduced. This case was tried here in 1901, and Feltner was given a year in the penitentiary, but the case was appealed by the late J.B. Markham to the Court of Appeal and reversed. The case was taken to Irvine on a change of venue. Several witnesses from this country are in attendance. 
unquote. Evidently, the trial did not last very long because the jury would come back with a verdict just seven days later. According to the Interior Journal, December 29, 1905, quote, The jury at Irvine in the case of Moses B. Feltner, charged with the murder of Jesse Fields, returned a verdict of not guilty, unquote. So, even though the first jury had found him guilty of the killing of Jesse Fields, the second jury would acquit him. Questions without answers. Now, let's think about this for just a minute. You have Fields, who was working for the French side of the French Eversol feud. You had Feltner, who was working for the Hargis side of their feud. Hargis and French were thick as thieves and would even be attorneys for each other. So, why didn't the shooting of Fields cause a rift between the two factions? And why did the two sides continue to use Feltner in their plans? Something else to think about is the trial of Moses B. Feltner for the murder of Jesse Fields that took place during the same time as the Markham Damage case. Did one trial influence the other trial? Was Feltner forthcoming with his information in the deposition of the Markham case because of the trials that he would have to face? When the verdict of not guilty was given for the murder trial, court dates and trials would still be in Feltner's future. But the biggest question of all was this, did Feltner get away with the murder of Jesse Fields? The first arrest made. Now, we have to backtrack a little here. Moses Feltner had previously taken off from the Winchester court with several other witnesses from the Markham Hargis damage case. Feltner would not be a very easy man to track down and only showed up later to testify by a written deposition. This deposition was discussed earlier in our video, The Breathitt County Criminal Trials, 1905, Part 2, The Testimony of Mose Feltner. But this would not be the only written deposition that Feltner would make because he did not appear in person in the Markham Hargis damage case. Judge Benton and other judges then made out warrants for his arrest on the charge of contempt of court and witness tampering. Sheriff McCord would be the person that would carry out this warrant. According to the semi-weekly Interior Journal article dated February 7, 1905, quote, Sheriff McCord and deputy returned to Winchester from Perry and Leslie counties with Moses Feltner and Sam Fields, who were wanted on the charge of contempt of court. The trip was uneventful and was made on horseback with the weather below zero. Both prisoners filed affidavits saying that they had left Winchester because they feared that they would be killed if they testified in the Markham Hargis damage suit, unquote. We will get to the depositions in a little bit. However, in the meantime, let's look at this. Both men were to testify in the Markham Hargis damage case. Both men surrendered themselves peacefully to the arrest warrants and the custody of Sheriff McCord. We have found more as to why they were not placed in the jailhouse, but other arrangements were made for the two men. According to the Bourbon News article dated February 7, 1905, quote, The prisoners took the whole story of the alleged bribes and threats, which induced them to leave Winchester before the Markham damage suit was called. Sheriff McCord asserts that Felix Feltner is shamming. Mose Feltner and Sam Fields have not been placed in jail, but under guard by Constable Pig, trying to get bond. Feltner and Fields fear assassination and will depositions, which will serve in the trial in the event that they are killed before they are able to testify, unquote. What did these men have to say about these events that both of them made a deposition to stand in their stead should they be killed? This was their first act when they reached Winchester, Kentucky. What does that say exactly? It says to us that both men were definitely afraid that this would happen, that if they dared to show their faces in the courtroom, they would be dead. Did Sheriff McCord believe them, and that is why they were not placed in the jailhouse? that they were placed somewhere else for their safety, sort of like what we know as a witness protection program today. And let's talk a little bit about Felix Feltner. As far as we can find out so far, Felix was a cousin to Moses. To call him shamming means that he was being duplicitous or feigning his compliance. So what was he saying that didn't line up with the two men? 
According to the U.S. Archive, we did find where there was a record of these events in the court record. It does match up with the newspaper article. Quote, Feltner and Fields have engaged Byrd and Juliet to defend them in the contempt cases, and Saturday they filed an affidavit denying any contempt for the court and each alleging that he could prove his position by the other. Each further alleges that he believes his witness, as aforesaid, will be killed before April term of this court convenes. Witnesses asked for the privilege of taking the depositions of the other, which privilege the court granted. The prisoners were not placed in jail, but were consigned to the custody of Doc Pig as a special officer who is guarding them and with whom they are staying. The expenses of the guard and also the board is paid by the prisoners themselves. Later, they have been sent to jail. James Hargis and Ed Callahan have been granted an appeal from the verdict. Unquote. Moses Feltner's Deposition Going back to the previous video and the affidavit that was given in the court record, there was no wonder that the defense team did not want Feltner to testify. Not only was his testimony incriminating in that instance, but this testimony would be just as incriminating as well. When this was first printed in the papers back in 1905, it was truly shocking that a Kentucky State Senator, two judges, and a sheriff could be caught up in such corruption in Breathitt County. According to the Adair County News article found in February 15, 1905 edition, quote, Feltner's Deposition, Sensational Development in Breathitt County Litigation, Louisville, Kentucky, February 8. Quite the most sensational development in the litigation of the Breathitt County murders came out when the deposition of Moses Feltner, a witness, who left Kentucky after having been subpoenaed as a witness in the damaged suit of Mrs. Markham against Judge Hargis and others for conspiracy in connection with the murder of James B. Markham says a special from Winchester, Kentucky. Feltner's statement is to the effect that the attorney for the defense, B.F. French, offered him $1,000 to leave Winchester without testifying, and that if he did not go, he would be hanged for the murder of Jesse Fields some time ago in Breathitt County. Feltner says he accepted the money, went to Cincinnati, and turned it over to his brother, Felix Feltner. Later, he, Mose Feltner, was met in Cincinnati by Mr. French and was told to stay there where he was as the warrants had been issued for him in many counties in Kentucky, bordering on the Ohio River. French told him, according to Feltner's deposition, that his bond had been vacated in the Fields murder case and that a warrant would be sent to Cincinnati for him, but that he must not come back to Kentucky without a requisition. But, Mr. French told me, the statement continues that Governor Beckham had promised him, French, that his requisition would not be issued until after the Markham Hargis case had been settled. French then gave him more money, and after spending some in various Ohio towns and Indianapolis, Feltner says that he concluded to return to Kentucky and give himself up as a witness. Lexington, Kentucky, February 9th. Moses Feltner will, through the Winchester attorneys, appeal to the governor for troops to guard him when he is taken to Jackson on the 20th to be tried on the charge of murdering Jesse Fields. As a result of startling evidence given in his deposition at Winchester, he fears assassination, unquote. After spilling the beans about how he was paid off to leave the state, and stay away until after the court had made its final decision, it is no wonder that Feltner was afraid. The feuds were infamous for killing off potential witnesses, threatening the jury and witnesses, threatening judges, and all kinds of things. It is a pretty sure bet that Feltner felt that he was going to be killed if he did not, or if he did, testify. The amount of the $1,000 in 1905 money would be equal to $34,857.50 in February 2024 exchange. That is quite a bit of money to leave Kentucky and live in the state of Ohio during the time of the trial. It is not stated how much money that French gave Feltner during his time in Cincinnati, but it must have been a fair sum to cover his living expenses during that time. 
Added to this was the threat that should Veltner return to the state of Kentucky, that he would face charges against him for the murder of Jesse Fields. We are not told the reason why Feltner decided that it was far better to return than to live a life on the run. However, his deposition would be backed up by the statement made by Sam Fields in his deposition. A word about the relationship between Felix and Moses. We have found in several places where the men are called brothers and cousins. We have looked up the genealogy of both men and cannot say for certain what the relationship was. However, both of the Feltner men were wrapped up in this trial. That is why you will see us call the two men brothers and sometimes cousins, depending on how the article reads. In next week's video, we will be covering the deposition made by Sam Fields and what, if anything, would happen to Feltner for these charges of contempt. Would the charges stick or not? Do you think he should have been charged with the crime? Do you think that he left the state of Kentucky with the witnesses because he was afraid for his life or because he was given a generous amount of money? We will also see the charges leveled at Felix Feltner as he would be the first man to face contempt charges. Sam Fields makes his deposition. While Sam's deposition would not be as explosive as Moses Feltner's, it does corroborate his testimony as to the events that happened around the Marcus Hargis trial. According to the Citizen, article dated February 16, 1905, quote, Deposition of Sam Fields. He is one of the witnesses who, it is alleged, were enticed away. Winchester, Kentucky, February 10th. The deposition of Sam Fields was taken. He was one of the witnesses who, it is alleged, were enticed away from here during the Markham Hargis trial and is now under arrest for contempt of court. He corroborated Moses Feltner in that B.F. French paid them money and that all expenses were paid by Feltner. Sheriff McCord received the Circuit Court of Breathitt County a warrant of arrest for Mose Feltner. It was issued at the request of S.H. Hurst, who was his bondsman for $5,000 for his appearance at Jackson to be tried for the killing of Jesse Fields and Hearst desired to be released from this bond. Circuit Judge Benton has stated that so long as the prisoners are in custody of Clark County officers, they shall not be taken to Jackson. Veltner will, therefore, not attempt to give bond. It is rumored that troops will be asked for when Feltner is taken to Jackson for trial in a few weeks, unquote. A couple of things here. A $5,000 bond was no small amount of money in 1905. That amount of money would be worth, as of February 2024, $174,287.50. We have no idea how much Feltner nor Fields was worth, if they were rich men or poor men. But even if they were rich, this is still a huge chunk of change to hand over for a bond. Whether or not S.H. Hurst was released from this bond or not, Feltner was still under bond when he got out of jail. According to the Mount Sterling Advocate article dated April 26, 1905, quote, Moses Feltner and Sam Fields are out of jail. Feltner gave a bond for $5,000. Fields was released on his own recognizance, unquote. Criminal Trials there would be a split in the cases for contempt of court. However, at this point in the events, the Hargises, Callahan, French, and Mose and Felix Feltner would be charged together. There would be a motion for a continuance, which would be denied by the court. According to the Breathitt County News article, dated April 7, 1905, quote, Continuance denied. The contempt cases at Winchester against the Hargises, Callahan, B.F. French, Mose Feltner, and Felix Feltner have been passed until the, after the trials at Lexington, in which some of the parties are involved. French and Felix Feltner filed affidavits for continuance, claiming sickness, unquote. Felix Feltner would be the first of the men to split off from the cases. He would end up being found guilty and faced a fine and jail time for his participation in the crime. According to the Mount Sterling Advocate, Article dated June 7, 1905. Quote, Jail sentence of two years and a fine of $3,000. Against Felix Feltner, 
other trials set for September. On Thursday in Clark Circuit Court, the above verdict was returned against Felix Feltner for contempt of court and having aided and abetted in spiriting away witnesses summoned to appear in the $100,000 damage suit of Mrs. J.B. Markham at Winchester against James and Alex Hargis, B.F. French, and Ed Callahan for complicity in murder of her husband in May 1903. This was the heaviest fine for contempt ever imposed in Kentucky. As Judge Benton had an open court in Nicholas this week, the cases against French, the Hargises, Mose Feltner, Sam Fields, and Ed Callahan were set for trial at a special term beginning September 1st. Sheriff McCord placed a special guard in charge of Moses Feltner, saying as much liberty was due him as the Hargises enjoyed. Feltner thinks that the conviction of Felix is a vindication of his, Moses' statements, in his famous affidavit about the assassinators and Breathitt, unquote. Now this seems a little odd to us. How could the conviction of Felix, Moe's cousin or brother, be a vindication to his statements? Please remember that we could not find where Felix fit into the family exactly, even though some reports him as Moses' brothers and others as his cousin. Did Moses feel vindicated because of what he was saying was truthful about the whole situation? That the reason why Moses left the state of Kentucky was by both bribe and threat, and that he felt that he had no choice in the matter? And by using Felix as a way for the men to be able to reach and intimidate Moses? The sentence for Felix was not just to sit in a jail cell for two years. According to the Hartford Republican article dated September 8, 1905, quote, The trial of Felix Feltner last spring resulted in a fine of $3,000 and imprisonment in the jail at hard labor for two years. Unquote. Again, we see a lot of money in this statement. Not only was Feltner to spend the next two years under the sentence of hard labor for his actions, but he was to pay a hefty fine as well. $3,000 in 1905 would amount to $104,572.50 in 2024 currency. Again, we don't know how rich Felix was, but that was a huge amount of money to pay for a fine back then. It seems that Judge Benton was not messing around when it came to contempt of court in his courtroom. For now, this was all of the information that we could find out about the contempt case that Mose Feltner had to face. We could not find where he went to court to actually face these charges and if he was found guilty or innocent. He will testify in the upcoming cases and he will drop some sensational charges against the men he will testify against. He will also have to face charges concerning the assassination attempt against Judge Hargis at a later date. So, even though we will be leaving Mos Feltner for now, he will be back again with our other cases in the timeline of events. The Markham Damage Case Appeals Verdict First, to clear the air about the Markham Damage Suit, Mrs. Markham was not pleased that Judge B. F. French and former Kentucky Senator Alex Hargis was not found responsible for the death of her husband, J. B. Markham. She appealed the decision to the Kentucky Appellate Court. It took two years for a decision to come down in the matter. According to the Daily Public Ledger, dated October 18, 1907, quote, the Court of Appeals has decided that the evidence in the damage suit filed by Mrs. J.B. Markham did not implicate Alex Hargis and B.F. French in the murder of her husband, sustained the verdict of the jury, unquote. In other words, the decision by the jury that both men were not responsible for the death of Attorney Markham stood. But the case had taken a wild turn before this point. Even though the jury stated that French and Hargis was not responsible for the death, the judge in the case was not happy with the events that had taken place. And Judge Benton was going to make sure that the shenanigans that took place in his courtroom was going to be answered for in a timely manner. Warrants Issued To say that Judge Benton was upset would be an understatement. How dare two judges, a Kentucky State Senator, and a Sheriff make a mockery of justice in his courtroom? 
It did not take long for Judge Benton to take action. According to the Breathitt County News, dated February 3, 1905, quote, Warrants Issued Judge Benton of Winchester issued warrants Tuesday for James Hargis, Ed Callahan, and B.F. French on the charge of running off certain witnesses for the plaintiff in the damage suit of Mrs. Markham against the defendants. One charge is made against the two Hargises and their bail is fixed at $2,000 each. There are two charges against B.F. French and his total bail was fixed at $3,000. Against Ed Callahan, there were three separate charges and a total bail required of him of $4,000. French was at once arrested and gave bond. Warrants were also issued for the arrest of Mose Feltner and Sam Fields of Leslie County, witnesses who left without testifying. Feltner's bond was fixed at $500 and Fields at $200. Judge Benton feels deeply the attempt to tamper with the integrity and dignity of his court, unquote. While we did break down the amount that the bail had been set at in a previous part of the story, we felt that once again we should state that the bail set for B.F. French for today's economy, in this case, would be substantially more money. $3,000 would be $105,142.16 in February 2024 currency. It seems that Judge Benton placed a high value on the integrity of the court, and anyone who violated that sacred institution would pay a very dear price. Witness Trouble Have you ever seen a moment when karma comes around in all of its full glory? This is how it happened for B.F. French during his court case. French had to serve Judge Hargis and Sheriff Callahan with subpoenas to testify on his behalf. This would kind of also be logical as they were also being dragged into the courtroom to face their own charges, not only for this crime, but for others as well. Even though French would face these charges alone and away from the other defendants, he still needed their testimony to prove his case. From the Daily Public Ledger, dated April 1, 1905. Quote, Subpoenas for Judge Hargis and Sheriff Callahan were sent to Lexington yesterday from Winchester, summoning them to appear there next Monday as witnesses for the defense in the case of the Commonwealth against B.F. French and others, who are the answer for contempt of court. Unquote. As the date of the trial of contempt of court grew near, there was a problem for the defense. It would seem that there were no witnesses that voluntarily or by subpoena showed up on their behalf. So a continuance was called in order for the defense to prepare for their case. According to the Daily Ledger, dated May 31, 1905, quote, The trial of the contempt cases of James and Alex Hargis, Ed Callahan, B.F. French, and Felix Feltner, growing out of the Markham damage suit, began at Winchester yesterday. An attempt was made Monday by the defense to secure the continuance of the cases against French and Feltner on the grounds of absence of witnesses, unquote. There may have been a huge reason behind this as the witnesses were facing their own court cases and were being advised by their own legal counsel not to testify. But it is ironic that here French stood, accused of paying a witness to get rid of as many witnesses as possible in the Markham damage case, is now having trouble because of a lack of witnesses. The continuance allowed. Most of the testimonies that were given in the Markham, Felix Feltner, Mose Feltner, Ed Callahan, and both Hargis brothers' trials were being repeated over and over again. And there were the affidavits given by Mose Feltner and Sam Fields that had to be dealt with. The defense needed time to prepare any witnesses that it could find, and so the question would be, would the time be granted? Quote, Clark Circuit Court. Circuit Court met on Monday. In the contempt cases against Felix Feltner and B.F. French, the court granted time for preparing affidavits. The contempt cases against Judge and Senator Hargis, Sheriff Callahan, Mose Feltner, Sam Fields, and Russell Wooten were passed for the present the court having decided to take up the cases against Felix Feltner and B.F. French. Felix B. Feltner of Hyden, Kentucky, arrived in Lexington Friday from Winchester with subpoenas for Judge James Hargis and Sheriff Ed Callahan. 
summoning them to appear in the Clark Circuit Court at Winchester Monday to answer in the contempt proceedings against B.F. French and others charged with spiriting witnesses away in the Markham damage suit. Hargis's and Callahan were also defendants with the Feltner and B.F. French in the contempt cases. Felix Feltner is a cousin of Mose Feltner. He is the man whom Judge Hargis is alleged to have paid the $2,500 to be given to Mose Feltner not to testify for the Commonwealth. He is the man who, with B.F. French, is charged with spiriting Mose Feltner, Sam Fields, and Ruck Cotton Gang away from keeping them from testifying in the Markham damage suit, taking these important witnesses to Ohio. It is for this offense that he and French, together with James Hargis and Ed Callahan, are now under contempt charge in the Clark Circuit Court. Unquote. These were very serious charges leveled against these men. Witness tampering in 1905 had varied legal consequences, depending upon the circumstances on which it occurred, the jurisdiction in which it happened, or the judge of the case. In other words, in 1905, it really depended upon where you were and what you did on if the charges could be brought against you. This would not be the end of the legal issues for French, as he would also face many charges of conspiracy to murder. The first of these charges would be leveled against French would come from the widow Markham. Arrest for murder. There is a very old saying, quote, when it rains, it pours, unquote. This means that one trouble can lead to a whole slew of others that were related to it. The widow Markham was not done with the men yet. Even though her civil trial was now over, she was about to embark on a criminal trial of her own against the accused men. According to the Mount Sterling Advocate, dated June 7, 1905, quote, James and Alex Hargis and B.F. French arrested for complicity in murder and sent to jail. On Wednesday afternoon, about 6 o'clock, Sheriff McCord of Clark in Winchester arrested the above on warrants issued by Police Judge Cardwell at Jackson at the solicitation of Mrs. J.B. Markham, charging complicity in the murder of her husband. They were committed to jail. A warrant issued for Ed Callahan for the same offense, unquote. So, the widow Markham was not about to let this one go. Someone was going to pay for the plot to kill her husband, and she was determined that all of the conspirators were going to do just that. Charged with contempt of court. So, let's back up a moment here, shall we? As we found out yesterday, Judge Benton was not happy with the defendants of the Markham Hargis case. There were many witnesses that were spirited away from the court so that they would not testify. We have found more information about what the charges were that B.F. French would face in his court hearing. According to the Adair County News, dated February 8, 1905, quote, Contempt of Court. Judge Benton issues orders of arrest for the Hargises and others. Winchester, Kentucky, February 1st. Judge Benton has issued orders for the arrest of James Hargis, Alex Hargis, Ed Callahan, and B.F. French requiring them to execute bond for their appearance here on the first day of the April term of the court, charging them with contempt of court and bribing, intimidating, and threatening witnesses in the Hargis Markham trial and sending them beyond the jurisdiction of the court. These witnesses were Mose Feltner, Buck Cotton Gang, Sam Fields, and others. Seven charges were made in all. B.F. French was arrested here on two charges and gave bond in $3,000. The others will be arrested at Jackson. Orders for the arrest of Mose Feltner and Sam Fields have also been ordered. It is said that Feltner has already been arrested in Leslie County on this charge. Unquote. These were very serious charges levied against French. And as we have seen in the beginning of the story, French would have to stand alone in the answer to his charges as the other men would take on their cases head on. Once again, to give this context, using the CPI inflation calculator, we will state that $3,000 in 1905 would be $105,142.16 in February 2024 currency. 
the arrest of French and others. Now this will be important as the trial of B.F. French takes place. Would you consider the action of Sheriff Whitson McCord and Jailer Boone to be out of line? Consider what the article states, according to the Bourbon News, stated June 2, 1905. Quote, Behind the bars once more. Judge James Hargis and B.F. French were arrested at Winchester Wednesday by Sheriff Woodson McCord on a warrant sworn out by Mrs. Markham before Police Judge F.P. Caldwell in Jackson, charging them in conjunction with Alex H. Hargis and Ed Callahan with the complicity in the murder of her husband, James Markham. Alex H. Hargis learned of the warrants at his country home near Winchester and came in and surrendered to Sheriff McCord. Judge Hargis and B.F. French were taken by Jailer Boone, to whom they had been turned over, to the Court View Hotel for supper, as supper at the jail was over. The three spent the night in the Winchester Jail. Callahan was arrested in Jackson, unquote. This event would be a bone of contention in the court. We could not find any statements or articles about Sheriff McCord mistreating those under his charge. In fact, we have come across many articles stating that he kept very well care of his prisoners, with some of them even staying in his own home. We also could not find any evidence that Sheriff McCord treated the Hargises and Callahan any differently than he did anyone else. So, it is a little confusing to us why this event would be brought up during the trial as a motion for McCord to leave the case. The trial begins. Hear ye, hear ye. The Circuit Court of Clark County in the city of Winchester, Kentucky is now in session. All rise as the Honorable Judge J.M. Benton enters the courtroom. All quotes in this section of the video will be according to the Hartford Republican, dated September 8, 1905. Quote, Hargis contempt case is called. The trial of French is begun. Hargis, Callahan, and Field demanded separate trial, which was granted. Winchester, Kentucky, September 4th. The calling today before the circuit judge, J.M. Benton, of the contempt cases against Alex Hargis, Judge James Hargis, B.F. French, Ed Callahan, Sam Fields, and Mose Feltner, charged with contempt of court and the alleged causing of several witnesses to leave the state during the trial of Mrs. James B. Markham damage suit for the murder of her husband, resulted in the Commonwealth's electing to try French. When the court adjourned, ten jurors have been accepted by both sides, unquote. The jury has been selected, all of the witnesses will be accounted for, and the accused and his counsel are present. Quote, when the case in which French, Callahan, and Senator Hargis were jointly indicted was called, the Commonwealth answered ready, and the court adjourned until the afternoon to allow the defendants to consult. Alex H. Hargis promptly asked for a separate trial, which was granted, unquote. Decisions had to be made on the defense side on how to proceed with these charges. The first of the defendants have asked for a separate trial concerning this matter. Alex Hargis would not be the last to leave this ship. It seems that they understood that even though they could receive different verdicts as a group, it was far too risky to appear together again. French and Callahan would file a motion for the judge to vacate the bench in their cases. Quote, when court met in the afternoon, French and Callahan filed an affidavit demanding that Judge Benton vacate the bench and alleged as a reason, therefore, that he was and had been for a long time prejudiced against them and that they did not believe they would get a fair and impartial trial at his hands. Judge Benton did not discuss the allegation of the affidavit, but promptly refused to vacate, unquote. This was not really that unexpected. The men had faced Judge Benton in court before, and he was the one that levied the charges against them. The men felt that he already had in mind what fines and jail time that they would receive before the witnesses was called. They thought that Judge Benton would not hear their evidence to the contrary. But, he was not the only one that they would make a motion to leave the case. Quote, An effort was also made by the defendants to prevent Sheriff McCord from exercising the functions of his office for the same alleged reasons. 
but Judge Benton also refused to require the sheriff to vacate, unquote. So, the defendants also felt that Sheriff McCord was not fair in his handling of the men in this case, that he was set against them because they had a previous case that they had lost in the court. But again, as previously discussed, we could find no evidence of this happening. Because of Judge Benton's ruling, Callahan would drop out of the case. Quote, At this point, Callahan asked for a separate trial, which was granted, of the three defendants the prosecution elected to try B.F. French, unquote. Why was B.F. French the first to be chosen to go to trial? Was this because there was more evidence to prove that he was guilty of these charges? That if you followed the money, B.F. French was the man who paid the bribe to Felix Feltner to give to Moses Feltner. Felix Feltner had already stood trial, and French was looking at the same exact fines and jail time. Quote, the trial of Felix Feltner last spring resulted in the fine of $3,000 and imprisonment in jail at hard labor for two years. Unquote. Something to keep in mind, all witness statements from the Markham, Britton, and Feltner trials will also be used in this trial. It was a fast trial as only the pertinent testimonies from the witnesses concerning the spiriting away of Feltner and others would be used. Judge Hargis testifies. We do have a record of one testimony in this case coming from Judge Hargis himself. He would testify against the advice of his counsel as he was also facing trial of his own for the same charges. According to the Daily Public Ledger, dated September 8, 1905, quote, Judge James Hargis, in the case of B.F. French, charged with enticing most Feltner and other witnesses out of the state, in the damage suit of Mrs. James B. Markham for the murder of her husband, testified at Winchester that $1,500 given to Feltner was only a loan. Judge Hargis put on the stand over the objection of his counsel, unquote. Once again, to give this context, we will use the CPI inflation calculator to state that in 1905, $1,500 in February 2024 currency would be $52,571.08. Was it really a loan or a bribe? And why would the money be exchanged between the witnesses during the trial if it was only a loan? Was this, wink wink, loan so that Feltner could get out of testifying in the case? There were too many witnesses that stated that French and Callahan went to the residence of Feltner to ask for his assistance. Feltner did not seek them out. The verdict is reached. Hold on to your bonnets and bowler hats, as this verdict was going to be epic. In 1905, there had never been such a case before the courts. Contempt of court was not a charge that was seriously taken on. It mainly was up to the jurisdiction of the court on whether the charges would be brought and the fines or jail time would be imposed. All quotes in this section are according to the Hartford Republican dated September 15, 1905. Quote, French guilty. Fined $5,000 for contempt of court. Jury believes in sustaining dignity of the court. Two favor fine of $25,000. Unquote. A small note, according to the CPI inflation calculator in 1905, $5,000 would be the equivalent of $175,236.93 and $25,000 would be the equivalent to $876,184.66 in February 2024. Continuing forward with this article. Winchester, Kentucky, September 9th. After being out since 1.45 p.m. today, the jury in the B.F. French contempt case was brought in a verdict of guilty at 10 o'clock tonight and fixed his punishment at $5,000 fine with no jail sentence attached. Interest here all the afternoon has been intense. Crowds have been congregated on every street corner and nothing else has been talked about. It was predicted early in the afternoon that the jury had determined his guilt, but were hung on the question of punishment. Such proved to be a mistake, unquote. 
So this was not a matter if French was going to be found innocent or guilty. This was a matter of how high the price would be for French to pay the courts for his actions. Keep in mind that French was an attorney himself and was a judge for a short time. This may have been one of the reasons why his fine was set so high, because he knew better than to break the law in the manner that he did. But this was not the end of the story for French. He was not happy with the verdict, and therefore he filed a motion for a new trial. Quote, French, through his attorneys, Hayes and Stevenson, immediately filed grounds for a new trial, and Judge Benton continued the hearing on the motion until the first day of the regular term, which is Monday, unquote. We are not told what grounds were stated for the request of a new trial. However, it must have been interesting, as Judge Benton was setting a new hearing for this motion for the following Monday. The article goes on to describe how the verdict was decided. Quote, the verdict came tonight as a surprise. While it was expected all afternoon, this evening it became apparent that the jury was badly divided. About 8 o'clock, they sent word to the court that they wanted to go to bed, as they could not agree tonight. Judge Benton sent word that they could go whenever they wished, whereupon they decided to stay a while longer, unquote. So, it was getting late. The jury had been in deliberation since earlier that day, and they were getting tired. For some reason, either they were getting close to a figure in a compromise, or they just needed the reassurance that they would not be there all night long. However, two hours later, the jury did reach their verdict. The reason behind the charges are now explained in the article. Quote, this makes the second defendant in these cases that have been found guilty. Felix Feltner was fined $3,000 and two years in jail. This is the largest fine ever imposed for contempt in Kentucky. The cause of this action arose during the trial of Mrs. Alberella Markham's damage suit against the Hargis brothers, Ed Callahan, and B.F. French. Tried before the circuit court in December last, when a judgment for $8,000 was rendered in favor of the plaintiff against Judge James Hargis and Sheriff Ed Callahan the other two defendants going to acquit. It was claimed by the prosecution that the defendants conspired and spirited away Mose Feltner and Sam Fields, two important witnesses for the plaintiff. According to Judge Benton, ordered the institution of contempt proceeding against the defendants, including Felix Feltner, a cousin of Mose Feltner. Felix was tried at the last term of court, also found guilty and punished as above stated. Unquote. There was a reason why the jury could not agree. It had nothing to do with guilt or innocence. It seems that everyone agreed upon the guilt portion of the charge. The disagreement came on the price for the fine. How much would be enough for the punishment? Quote, when the jury had been discharged, it was learned that while all agreed upon the issue of guilt, the division came upon the punishment. Two of the jurors wanted to place the fine as high as $25,000. Others insisted that the fine of not more than $100. These figures offered the ground for argument. The jury finally compromised on the $5,000 fine. French was not incarcerated as he had sufficient property in Clark County to make good the fine, unquote. With the understanding that French was more than capable of paying off the fine, he was not given any jail time. Felix Feltner was given jail with hard labor to work off his fines. However, French would still not accept this verdict, and so he filed an appeal, and it went up to the Kentucky Appellate Court. The Kentucky State Court of Appeals Verdict It would be reasonable to believe that the reason why the appeal was accepted on the grounds that Judge Benton would not vacate the case. The fear that he would not render a fair and just verdict was in contention. The court heard the case and rendered their rulings. According to the Franklin Roundabout, dated November 24, 1906, quote, We'll not run off any more witnesses. B.F. French and Felix Feltner, who were fined by Judge Benton for contempt and running off witnesses in the Markham suits against Targus, Callahan, and French, at Winchester, appealed their cases to the Court of Appeals. On Wednesday, that court affirmed the judgment of the Circuit Court. French was fined $5,000 and Feltner was fined $3,000 and sentenced to two years in jail. It won't be so funny now to run off witnesses in that section 
and probably justice will be done in other cases, unquote. So there was disdain for French and his part to play in the spiriting away of witnesses in the Widow Markham case. The fine was seen as being heavy enough of a burden to discourage such behavior again. Land for Sale For all of those who have also been keeping up with the readings of the Mountain Eagle that we have been documenting, there were a whole bunch of U.S. Marshal sales, coal land sales, and land agent companies with advertisements for different construction companies that were coming into the area of the Appalachian Mountains. With these companies came scoundrels that saw a way to make money quick. It was not unheard of at that time for land to be sold under nefarious circumstances. Land agents would go door to door offering pennies on the dollar for mineral rights on the property that someone owned. During this time, illiteracy was at an all-time high in the mountains. Many towns had schools that went only to the 8th grade in many rural communities. A lot of people did not know how to read or write their own names on a piece of paper. What the land agents would do is to get people to sign a blank piece of paper under a false pretense and then copy the signatures on a deed and or write a bill of sale for the property on the piece of paper. A lot of people were killed if they refused to sign the paper or if they refused to sell the mineral rights to their property. But this would not be the only scam for land scandal in the mountains. One of the more shocking is the one that has been buried by the newspapers. We have to wonder if this had to do more with embarrassment by the coal companies that was purchasing the said fraudulent land. That even though the people doing the schemes were never really brought to justice, they were nonetheless vilified by the people in their areas. Even the history of some of the land agents and their enforcers have been airbrushed over time to seem more saintly towards those that opposed them than they actually were. These agents often hired the law enforcement of the area to act on their behalf to remove residents from their own lands so that the coal companies could occupy it. That is why one particular land agent is often called a sinner or a saint, depending upon which side you were on concerning the land. Scandal in the Mountains The whole scheme of selling non-existent land was exposed by a postal investigation into mail fraud. Evidently, a post office in Chicago, Illinois became suspicious when there was a whole lot of mail correspondence coming from the United States Land Syndicate and different places in the southern United States. We get a glimpse of how the scheme was discovered and took place. It had to do with land in the South and a law that was on the books in 1785. According to the article that appears in the Paducah Sun dated March 27, 1903. Quote, Frauds unearthed. Post Office Department ferrets out a big southern swindle. Chicago, March 27th. A new get-rich-quick scheme has been unearthed by post office officials which promises to lay bare numerous cases where innocent people have been deprived of hard-earned savings. Alluring advertisements sent through the mails have proved to be the undoing of the parties concerned. The United States Land Syndicate, with offices at 167 Washington Street, is the firm which the post office authorities assert that has been swindling thousands of unsuspecting people by selling land located nearly every state in the South. The scheme found its origin in the law passed in 1785, which gave to settlers 1,000 acres in the best agricultural country of the South. In 1794, this law was repealed, but many persons had already obtained titles to large tracts. The law which repealed the statute passed in 1785 invalidated all titles held by the settlers. It is such invalid titles that the United States Land Syndicate has been acquiring. When a prospective purchaser of the land presented himself at the offices of the company, these titles, it is charged, were exhibited and to be secured a better hold on the would-be buyer, a retaining fee of $5 or $10, was asked to pay for the recording of the deed and abstract titles. Thus far, two men, Lewis Enright and A.T. Denser, who were supposed to be the heads of the United States Land Syndicate, had been arrested and held to the federal grand jury under $1,500 bonds, unquote. 
As far as we can find, and more may come out about this as time passes, Lewis Enright and A.T. Zinser were the only two men that were charged with the federal crime of fraud concerning the scandal. The crime involved the states of Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. This land was sold with the promise that the person who bought the tract of land could occupy the land as it was unclaimed and could be occupied without a grant given by the United States Land Syndicate. Officials in Breathitt, Lee, and Wolf Counties caught in land fraud. We have actually heard of the United States Land Syndicate and Jesse Spicer before. Evidently, Spicer had some involvement with Richard Bros, Potter, and Mayo of Eastern Kentucky. We have evidence where he was involved in some counties, but came across no direct evidence that he was involved in Letcher County. However, we do find it interesting that during this time period that the counties that he had business in were feuding. More evidence of fraudulent land was being revealed as well as the Get Rich Quick scheme was unfolding. The arms of the law was now starting to extend to the counties of eastern Kentucky. According to the article that appears in the Hopkinsville Kentuckian dated August 7, 1903, quote, Huge fraud alleged. Great swindle in Kentucky mountain lands revealed. Lexington, Kentucky, August 4th. A fraud order against the United States Land Syndicate Company issued in Washington is said to reveal a gigantic land swindles in Breathitt, Wolf, and Lee Counties, Kentucky. The company has been disposing of lands to which it had no title and charging recording fees and alleged back taxes, unquote. Was it the company itself that was charging these back taxes and recording fees, or was it the corrupt men that were over the county that was charging these fees? While we could not find where these men on the smaller end of this scheme ever faced charges of fraud, it is interesting that a lot of people got rich from this and suddenly disappeared from the area once it all came out and was exposed. Details of the Scheme it took nine months for all of the details and the full scope of the scheme to be exposed. Not only were these men selling land that did not belong to them, but they were also selling imaginary land that never existed. We are pretty sure that there were several people who were very surprised to find out that they no longer owned their own land. That it had already been sold using the 1785 law that had already been taken off of the books. And not only was this land sold, but evidently there were fake back taxes owed on said property. According to the article that appears in the Mount Sterling Advocate dated December 30th, 1903, quote, Swindled by worthless deeds to land in Breathitt. The United States Land Syndicate catches victims by the hundreds. Two county officials of Breathitt disappear and may be implicated. A few months ago, E.L. Noble, Deputy County Clerk, and J.E. Spicer, Deputy Sheriff, left Jackson suddenly and without notice to their friends while they were leaving. There were faint rumors to the effect that both men were seen in New York and that they were in Europe. Nothing definite has been heard of them. It came to the ears of the public about this time that a gigantic land swindle was being operated by persons in Chicago calling themselves the United States Land Syndicate and having associates in Breathitt County who were now supposed by some to have been Deputy Clerk E.L. Noble and Deputy Sheriff J.E. Spicer. Tracks sold for $5. The Chicago people had bought for a nominal sum the open title to a large boundary of land. The title was the patent granted to James Reynolds in 1786 by the Commonwealth of Virginia. After a series of transfers, the title came into the possession of A. Colburn, trustee for the syndicate, after the land had been occupied as a homesteads by farmers for 50 to 100 years. Under patents from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the syndicate made deeds to 61 and a half acres of land to each of their vendees for the small sum of $5. On each of these deeds was printed a statement that it must be sent to E.L. Noble, Deputy Clerk, with $2.25 to pay for its being recorded. This is 50 cents more than the statutory clerk's fee. 
it is not certainly known whether Noble had an arrangement with the Chicago people, but it is known that when the people who thought that they were buying mountain land and not simple paper wrote to Noble instead of giving them the information they so much needed, he wrote letters giving encouraging reports of the land and its value and said nothing of the worthlessness of the title of the land. Mr. Spicer was given as a reference by the syndicate, and it was supposed that he made some misleading statements to the inquirers. Part of the deal. It seems to have been part of the deal for Spicer to write to the purchasers, stating that there was a certain amount of back taxes due, and thus collecting a great deal of money. Two brothers in Chicago named Kelly bought two of the A. Coburn deeds and were preparing to set out for the mountains of Kentucky when it occurred to their father that perhaps the deal was not right. And he at once wrote to Pollard and Redwine, attorneys at Jackson, asking for their advice. The lawyers, after investigating the matter, advised Kelly that the titles his sons had purchased were worthless and that his sons had been swindled. A short time after that number of lawyers, surveyors, and businessmen interested in the United States Land Syndicate were arrested by the postal authorities in Chicago for a fraudulent use of the mails. None of the money paid by the victims for taxes was turned into the sheriff, and there is, of course, no record in the sheriff's office of these payments. It seems, also, that in most cases, the purchaser was advised that it would be well to have the tract resurveyed in order to verify the boundary, and many of them did so. In this way, many of the men who were foolish enough to buy these worthless deeds without investigation was caught not only for the price of the mythical land, but for a clerk's fee and for taxes, and in some cases for a surveyor's fee. The deeds are, of course, absolutely worthless. Letter from a Victim The Lexington Herald gives the following letter from one of the victims of the Breathitt County land frauds. July 29, 1903, The Morning Herald, Lexington, Kentucky. Dear Sirs, You should have stated your object in making the inquiry about A. Coburn, etc., etc. However, I take it for granted that it is correct to answer you. I purchased altogether 1,280 acres of land of the U.S. Land Syndicate, 500 acres of which are claimed to be located in the James Reynolds Land Grant in Breathitt County, Kentucky, 250 acres in some grant in Wolf County, Kentucky. I paid a tax for last year of $25.50 on the Breathitt County land and was assured by Deputy Clerk E.L. Noble and Deputy Sheriff J.E. Spicer that the land was valuable and that the title was good. I hold their letters. I paid Mr. G.W. Noble $9 to survey this land. He assured me that he had a number of surveys for recent purchasers and that they were all well pleased and assured me that he could sell the land for a good price as soon as it was surveyed. And named coal companies who stood ready to buy as fast as the surveys were made. And he added, quote, in fact, I will buy it myself, unquote. The United States Land Syndicate seems to have a good title to the land, and they furnish me an abstract title. That is, a complete chain back to the government. Lewis Enright, 2281 West Monroe Street, Chicago, is one of the men concerned in the syndicate. He writes that ex-senator and ex-secretary of treasury, Guthrie, Kentucky, says our titles are all right. He also claims that the courts that recently gave them a hearing decided that all the Breathitt County, Kentucky and French's County, Tennessee land to which they lay claims were held in good title and that the deeds given to such lands by said parties were legal deeds. The Merchants Bank, Northeast Corner, LaSalle, and Lake Street, Chicago, also wrote me that the courts decided that the titles to the above-named lands to be valid. Yes, I hold the receipts for the tax in Breathitt County, Kentucky for $25.50, and in Wolf County, Kentucky for $7.13. Also, a receipt from G.W. Noble for $9, his charges for making the Breathitt County survey, which he has never made, unquote. 
Considering that the living wage of that time was around 10 to 15 cents an hour, this was an enormous price to be paid for this land. Now we have the scheme that was taking place at the time of the bloody breath at county feuds. We feel that the idea of this land being sold was not only to individuals, but also to coal and oil companies for the purposes of mining the area. This was at a time that the steel mills of Pennsylvania was starting to work in full swing. The Industrial Revolution of the Americas was starting to take off and coal was needed as its fuel. How Spicer and Noble Got Overlooked Let's take a step back and look at the turmoil that was going on in Breathitt County at that time. There were several criminal trials going on at the same time in several counties over the same murders. Then there was a huge civil case that was being fought in Clark County. But up to this point, even though the names of Noble and Spicer came up a couple of times in these court proceedings, they were nowhere to be found and they did not send an affidavit for their testimony. So, where were they? We were not the only ones to ask this very question, according to the article that appears in the Mount Sterling Advocate, dated December 30th, 1903. Quote, Lish Noble returns. Jackson was treated to a sensation last week by the sudden arrival of former deputy clerk E.L. Noble, who left there a few days after Markham assassination in the company of Deputy Sheriff Jesse Spicer. The mysterious disappearance of these two young men, following upon the arrest of Curtis Jett, gave rise to the report that they were in some way connected with the Markham murder. But it soon developed that they were alleged to be implicated in the land scheme operated by Chicago Sharpers under the name of the United States Land Syndicate. And upon being notified of the plight of their Chicago associates, they disappeared. Noble was said to have been an eyewitness to the killing of Markham. And Jett filed a lengthy affidavit for continuance on account of Noble's absence alleging that Noble would state that Jet was on the sidewalk at the time Markham was shot, unquote. So it appears that both men went on the run immediately after the murder of Markham. But why? Did it have to do with Markham's murder, or was it something else? Both men were heavily implicated in the land fraud scheme that got busted in Chicago. As we have previously stated, the United States Land Syndicate had two men arrested for fraud, and were facing federal charges. So it would stand to reason why all this was going down in Washington, D.C., that Noble and Spicer would not want to be found and face potential charges of fraud on their own. Spicer's Mysterious Train Ride But just a year later, we find something curious. While the newspaper did not state why Jesse Spicer had to go to Frankfurt, it is very interesting that he was in the company of a sheriff, a judge, and several prisoners. Was he being charged with fraud or possibly the murders at this point? And what business did he have in Frankfurt? According to the article that appears in the Breathitt County News, dated April 29, 1904, quote, Sheriff James P. Sizemore and company of County Judge William Robinson and Jesse Spicer left on the LNA train on Wednesday morning for Frankfurt with the following prisoners sentenced to the penitentiary, unquote. You would think that he would travel on his own accord without the company of these people if he was a free person. Also, if he was working in an official capacity as deputy sheriff, the newspapers would state that fact. But instead, we see him listed as only Jesse Spicer. So, this just adds to the mystery of what he was doing in Frankfort, Kentucky. The Bigger Picture the newspaper articles about Jesse Spicer skips ahead about three years. We get more of a complete picture of when Spicer skipped town. We also see that he did not leave without having funds. The article also gives more of a complete picture of what Spicer's role was in the scam. According to the article that appears in the Breathitt County News dated May 31, 1907, quote, Eagle Eye of the Law. Overlooked Jesse Spicer, accused of murder. Big Pistol, Jesse Spicer, is probably the only man in the United States under indictment for three murders, for whom no reward has ever been offered, and who is a fugitive from justice, with no one looking for him. 
when the United States militia, under the orders of the governor, swept down on Jackson in Breathitt County and stopped a series of assassinations, Jesse Spicer quickly packed his trunk and slipped away. In the excitement, he was not missed. It is charged that he carried away with him many thousands of dollars. Detectives employed by Northern Investors report that for several years, Spicer was the leader of a band of men who had been receiving money from all parts of the United States. Advertising extensively and selling claims to Bretha and Perry County Timberland, to which they gave titles. The deeds were executed and recorded, but the described property was afterward reported fictitious. Spicer had been closely connected with the Hargises during the reign of assassination. He has been indicted in both Breathitt and Fayette counties for the murders of Dr. Cox, James Cockrell, and James B. Markham. When last heard of, Spicer was in San Francisco, and it is said that he perished in the earthquake which destroyed the city last year. Unquote. Okay, we will find out during the trials that took place as late as 1909 that Spicer did not die in the San Francisco earthquake. He will face trial alongside of the Hargises and others. However, we will state that we could not find any historical records concerning Jesse Spicer or what happened to him after those events. Also, according to this article, we now have a connection between the feuds going on in Perry and Breathitt counties. It seems that B.F. French was not the only connection between the two. But we do find it odd that the murders of Cockerell and Cox would be tried in Fayette County, as the men did not die, nor was the crime of murder committed in that county. Questions we are asking in the upcoming trial. This actually leaves us with more questions than answers. Why would Spicer and Noble wait until after the murder of Markham to leave town if the whole land scandal was exposed a couple of months before that point? After all, James Markham would die on May 4, 1903, and the United States land syndicate scandal would hit the newspapers on March 27, 1903. So, why wait if the men thought that they could be arrested at any time by federal agents? Conversely, why leave if Markham was the reason that the men thought that they would be caught? Did Spicer and Noble direct the Hargis and French factions about how to handle those that opposed what they were doing? How in the world would someone that was accused of land and mail fraud be connected to a string of murders in Breathitt County? And why not also in Perry County? And furthermore, why would Spicer be indicted for the murders and yet he would not be arrested or even hunted down to face the charges? Were Spicer and Noble the actual linchpins that connected everyone together and gave the reason behind the murders? Were these murders committed because Cox, Cockrell, and Markham came close to exposing the scandal in Breathitt and Perry counties that would implicate the Hargises and French factions? And if so, how many of the murders in Perry County were actually connected to this scandal? When the news about the United States Land Syndicate hit the newspapers, was this the connection that Markham needed to piece everything together that was going on in both counties? Was this the reason behind Markham going to the courthouse to file paperwork concerning the deeds and also the reason why there were several lawsuits that Markham would be part of that implicated Sheriff Callahan? Could this have been what was written in the newspapers about Kentucky State Senator Alex Hargis and he wanted a public apology because it implicated him in this scandal? Will any of these questions finally be answered in the trial or will they be covered up? And why, before now, wasn't any of this handed down to future generations about what was really going on during this time? Why the cover-up for 100 years? In next week's video, we will begin the main Hargis criminal trial. Settle in, because there will be a lot of new confessions and testimonies that have not been heard before. As well as there will be seven men charged with the murders of Cockrell, Cox, and Markham, including Jesse Spicer. Will these men be finally found guilty and go to prison, or will all seven men finally be set free and found innocent? We will let you decide as our 13th juror if the verdict was a just one. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Feuds. 
Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification button. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries in Appalachian history.